Good evening. Let's give another minute or so for everyone to join us today. I'd just like to let everyone know that we're recording meeting at this time. And good evening. My name is Lauren Delmar with the Fairfax County Department of Transportation. Welcome to this virtual community meeting on the proposed safe streets for all program. I'll let Nancy translate that. Buenas noches, esta es uh, Ms. Lauren. Ella está participando aquí con el Departamento de, de, de Transportación del Condado de Fairfax. Para aquellos que hablen, para escuchar la presentación, por favor, ya se haga una pregunta, por favor, llamen al 443-228-6670 y... Le van a pedir la identificación sería 6670. We'll just take another moment here to allow anyone who requires translation to call into the number. Do you want me to mute now, ma'am? Yes, please. Thank you. All right, well, we'll go ahead and get started again. Thank you and welcome. Just first, want to start off with a few logistics. Uh, per all participants are muted until they're called upon. Uh, there will be multiple polls near the end of our presentation tonight and then time for discussion following those polls. Uh, if you have any questions throughout the uh, presentation, please type them in the Q&A. And we will discuss them during the uh, discussion period at the end. Uh, or you can use the raised hand feature if you would like to provide verbal feedback. Um, and if you're calling in and you would like to speak to raise your hand, you'll need to press pound three or hashtag three uh, to raise your hand. And then the moderator will unmute you and call upon you when it's time for you to speak verbally. So I want to welcome you all tonight and thank you for joining us. Uh, we really greatly appreciate your time and your commitment towards a safer Fairfax County for people walking and bicycling um, and all travelers on our roadways. We're going to start off with a few introductions. Um, again, my name is Lauren Delmar with the Fairfax County Department of Transportation. I'm an active transportation engineer. And then I believe joining us tonight we have um, man, manning things behind the scenes, my colleague Nicole Winans, uh, also Chris Wells, all of us with the active transportation team. And then we have Tom Bashadney, our director, with us tonight. Uh, and then we have anyone else? Double check. Um, I think Tom, I'm going uh, to give it to you for any opening remarks. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. Safe streets are really um, critical to all of us, um, whether we're walkers, bikers, transit users, or drivers. So we really appreciate you taking the time tonight to 
join us and to share your opinions on how we can improve the safety of our streets here in Fairfax County. The presentation you will see tonight is going to um, show you a number of different options and we're gonna be asking for your opinions. So please feel free to share those openly, um, whether during the polls or in the uh, question and answer section, but uh, we're definitely looking forward to your um, opinions and your feedback so we can make this program the, the best that we possibly can for Fairfax County. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Tom. So the rest of our agenda tonight is we're going to go over the active Fairfax transportation plan project as a big overview and how that dovetails into the active um, transportation safety needs in Fairfax County and this safe streets for all um, proposed program. Then we'll have our polls, as I mentioned, and some discussion, and then we'll talk about next steps about where this program uh, is headed after uh, these community meetings. So, first, a definition of active transportation. So, active transportation is mostly non motorized travel. It includes walking, biking, hiking, riding a scooter, which is semi motorized, a lot of e scooters, um, or an e bicycle is another uh, alternative, or a horse for transportation or recreational purposes. In 2020, we launched our active Fairfax transportation plan effort which will update the planning guidance for sidewalks, trails, bikeways, and crosswalks. And we are currently still in that effort. <laughs> this uh, shows you the active Fairfax transportation plan priorities. Uh, they include to plan a connected and comfortable network of sidewalks and streets, including complete streets, which we'll talk about a little later, bikeways and trails that serve people of all ages and abilities to help engineers and planners design safer crosswalks and with more frequency between them uh, to encourage crosswalk use, uh, to recommend changes to laws that could help make walking and biking safer and more comfortable. For example, regulations that might require single family homes to rebuild uh, or that are rebuilding to add a sidewalk uh, in front of the home, or to recommend programs and initiatives to encourage people to walk and bike. For example, bike to school day, bike to work day, bike your park day, or employer uh, financial incentives for pedestrian and bike commuters. And then to recommend what areas or streets should be imp improved first. So from this, uh, we ha have known and, and we have identified that over many years we've had a um, safety concern for our active transportation users. Between 2014 and 2020, an average of 183 people walking and 63 people biking were struck by a vehicle every year in Fairfax County. And that is just the recorded number that we know about from police reports. Um, so, in, and, and then in that time also from uh, the, in the last five years, we've had between 10 and 17 fatalities per year, including in 2021, we've had 13 fatalities to date with 11 of those being pedestrians and two being bicyclists. Uh, in January of 2020, um, recognizing this um, problem, the Board of Supervisors passed a motion to make Fairfax County safer for pedestrians and bicyclists, which included to establish and achieve measurable safety goals. So as part of the active Fairfax transportation plan effort, we developed draft recommendations, which we'll share some of those with you tonight uh, for a countywide safe streets for all program, which will become a standalone initiative independent of the active Fairfax transportation plan once it's approved. And uh, this program really focuses on those active transportation users. We have other programs in the state that are um, very much geared towards improving safety for drivers on the roadways, uh, but still improving safety for active transportation users um, often comes along with some of the same design elements that also improve safety for drivers. So now we're gonna, I'm gonna share a few maps and images of the county and where these pedestrian and bicycle crashes that I mentioned earlier are happening throughout the county. And we're breaking it down here by pedestrian and bicycle on the left and the right, respectively. 
Um, this uh, chart shows you by the numbers. So how many exactly crashes are happening? The bigger the circle, the more crashes. Um, note that it's different scales for pedestrian and bicycle, so you can't really compare the two, but you can get a sense of um, these pedestrian crashes. They're happening in clusters, but they're in some places, but they're all over the county. And similarly, the bicycle crashes are happening all over the county. The next um, maps will show you the crash rate per 1,000 residents in a census block. So again, these are different scales, but they it does give you a sense of um, for how many people live in this area, how many crashes are occurring. And this is all over the same a five year period from 2014 to 2018. And then the last uh, chart shows crashes per crash rate per roadway mile. So, for instance, in the pedestrian on the pedestrian map, you can see that there's uh, 13 crashes per mile on this southeasternmost segment of Leesburg Pike. I know it's a little hard to read, but we've identified the high risk corridors, which are highlighted in red or blue, and then the ones that are bold are the top 15 or sorry, top 10 high risk corridors in the county for both pedestrian crashes and bike crashes. Furthermore, we looked at how the proximity to transit is really related to crashes. So for pedestrian crashes, 90% of them occur within a quarter mile of a transit station or bus stop. And for bicycle crashes, that's 80%. And that's likely more of a correlation and not a causation relationship. So most crashes are happening in denser areas where buses run or there's activity centers or transit stations. So uh, we have a a huge bus coverage in our county, and a lot of that's happening in the same kind of places where we have a lot of pedestrian and bicycle activity. So it's it's expected, perhaps, that that would those would uh, correlate. We'll also talk a little bit later about the importance of vehicle speed. So why why is this so important? Um, this chart gives you a sense of the likelihood of a fatality or a serious injury in the event that a vehicle strikes a pedestrian at varying speeds. Mm -hmm. So at 20%, we're looking at only a, a 18% like, sorry, 20 miles per hour, we're looking at only an 18% likelihood that a pedestrian would have a serious injury or fatality. But by 40 miles per hour, we're looking at 77%. And some um, data has shown that even higher. Uh, and then at the the bottom of this chart, you can also see the cone of vision starts to narrow. So the ability for the driver to even see the pedestrian in order to yield or stop for the pedestrian uh, is, is reduced the faster that the driver is going. I also just want to point out that the lowest speed on this chart is 20 miles per hour. Uh, however, all of our roads in Fairfax County have a minimum speed of our public streets have a minimum speed of 25 miles per hour. And oftentimes we see people traveling at up to 30 miles per hour on those roads or faster. So our, our true minimum speed here in this county tends to be closer to 30 miles per hour. This, this uh, chart shows the impact of street design. So this is a map of Reston Town Center and it shows the crashes that occurred uh, around Reston Town Center from 2014 to 2018 as these little dots. So these are the different types of crashes fatal injury all the way down to just property damage, which we don't have when we have a pedestrian bicycle crash. I guess if somebody actually uh, bumped their bicycle, that might be the only thing, but typically it goes down to non-visible injury, see? So uh, on these roadways surrounding Reston Town Center where they're wider and higher speed, like New Dominion, which is up in the upper left-hand side of the screen, you can see that there's crashes at every one of these intersections. It's actually pretty impressive that they're only happening at the intersections and that's likely because of the, the dense street grid that's in this area. Um, then when we have a market street, we have this narrow, slower speed roadway on the upper right. You can see that there were no crashes reported uh, in this period on that street. So I mentioned we would talk a little bit about complete streets because I think complete streets and safe streets, they can be a little jargony and a little confusing. So what is a complete street? Uh, complete street has a space for all users. So it has space for pedestrians, for bicyclists, for transit, for shared mobility, like uh, scooter, shared scooters or bike share stations. And it has a space for cars and not just um, driving, 
for cars moving. Uh, it also has space for cars parking, and it might have fewer or narrower lanes than a typical roadway. Um, and then it also has a uh, space for refuge or rest with street trees, benches, and those types of features that may make the street inviting for all users. But so every street doesn't need to be a complete street. There are some needs for places for some streets to not be complete. They don't have to have every single one of these elements, but every street should be a safe street. And a complete street is always a safe street. And a, but a safe street doesn't always have to be a complete street. So hopefully that clarifies it a little bit. So what is safe streets and what are what is the safe streets for all approach? So on the right hand side of the screen, you see these images. These are not, this is not the safe streets for all approach. Uh, we can see how they're unwelcoming to people walking and bicycling. They might induce more driving. This is not what we envision when we think of a safe street. What we do is um, these are four of the key principles of safe streets for all. They are pedestrian and bicycle deaths and injuries are preventable. Roads are planned and designed to be efficient and safe for everyone. Safety issues are addressed before crashes occur. So it's a proactive um, uh, technique. Oh, and I just want to touch on also that for the second one, that the design details can be really important when this woman's trying to cross the street on the bottom of the screen here, you can see that we're right at an intersection, but there's some reason that she's not crossing at that intersection. There's some reason why it's safer or more convenient for her to cross where she's crossing. How can we make that intersection more desirable to cross at? Provide another crossing somewhere else that's more desirable. Um, what can we do to to in the in the design details to improve the facilities here? And then lastly, all road users share the responsibility to keep others safe. So it's not just the responsibility of drivers, and it's not just the responsibility of pedestrians or bicyclists. It's everyone's shared responsibility. So this past spring. We uh, asked the community about active transportation concerns and barriers through the active Fairfax transportation plan. And when we asked them to describe their experience walking or biking, then 27% of the respondents said that they feel that the current active transportation network is unsafe. These are some of the responses, the words that we got back as feedback from the community members regarding how they felt walking and biking in Fairfax County. And you can see that there's a lot of themes around safety. The word safety appears, but also words like needing bike lanes, places to rest, traffic calming, education, um, lighting, crossings was a big word, which is often related to safety, sidewalks. A lot of these words tie, tie directly in with the theme of safety. Now this map shows our barriers and destinations to active transportation. Now we're still collecting this data and I will share the link later so that you can provide feedback if you haven't already. But these barriers and destinations, as you can see, are all throughout the county. So this is a countywide issue and um, we're gonna talk next about uh, what the Safe Streets for All plan proposed or program proposes to do to change that. So based on community feedback, our team developed strategies to improve road safety for active transportation users. We have seven target areas, and these are essentially the key issues that we wanna address. They were informed by the Active Fairfax Transportation Plan Community Survey, by crash data, and by best practices. So the first is to focus on high risk, meaning locations that have a, a high likelihood of having crashes based on the crash data and high use locations, Loca uh, high use meaning places with the land use or the activity that would um, generate a lot of pedestrian and bicycle activity. And then the second is safer street design. So that can be achieved with, uh, depending on the roadway widths, crosswalks, the sidewalks and bikeways, street lighting and many other factors in our design. The third is lower vehicle speeds, as we talked about the importance of that earlier. And then the fourth is fewer trips by vehicle. So that can mean um, converting some of those vehicle trips into pedestrian and bicycle trips by making the pedestrian and bicycle environment more accommodating and more friendly. Then we have maintenance of sidewalks, bikeways and trails, safety education for all road users and enforcement. Now we'll talk about the proposed program framework 
that we uh, all of our recommendations fall into one of the following categories. So these and this, these overlap with this, the the target areas from the previous slide, but they um, they they're all of our program all of our recommendations are falling into one of these, and some of them really overlap with many. So we have policy and planning, uh, street design and traffic engineering, equity and social justice, funding and implementation, which includes staffing education and traffic safety culture and monitoring and evaluation. So now we're going to get into our polls. So this is going to be a little fun uh, interactive portion of the presentation. So the question that we're asking for all of the following polls, we're going to go through each um, each recommended uh, group uh, and then we're going to ask you what you think are the most important uh, recommendations to improve active transportation safety. And so for each one, we'll ask you to select your top two priorities. Um, just keep in mind when you're re reviewing these that these are some, but not all of the recommendations from the program. Um, and if you think we're, we're missing something that's really important, we would love to discuss that during the discussion. Um, and you can drop it in the Q and A uh, or uh, we'll talk about it in the discussion period. But for now, we're just trying to get a sense of what you think are the priorities. So uh, Nicole's gonna wizard this poll up for us. There it is. So I'll go ahead and read the, the options and then uh, please note when you're looking at the poll, it's a little hard to see. There's the, le the letters A, B, C, D. To the left of them, there's a little box with the check where you can put your check mark. When you go ahead and put your check mark in there, you can cho please choose two um, and then you can submit in the lower right hand portion of the poll. So we'll go ahead and start with this. The top two priorities, adopt safe streets for all and complete streets policies. Two policies and procedures to improve maintenance for active transportation. Three, to strengthen requirements for infrastructure implementation by development. And four, policies supporting lower traffic speeds, particularly in residential neighborhoods and commercial areas. So please go ahead and choose your top two, again, with the little very faint, at least on my screen, it's very faint, uh, square check boxes, please. We'll give you another minute to think about that and then we'll share the results of the poll. I apologize. I see now that we have varying one, two, three, four, and A, B, C, D. We will please <laughs> course correlate them. All right. So the poll time has closed. So Nicole's going to share the results for us. There we go. So it looks like uh, the top. Uh, Priority was to adopt a safe streets for all and complete streets um, policies. And we had policies supporting lower traffic speeds. So I made a good case there, I suppose, <laughs> particularly in residential neighborhoods and commercial areas. Um, and then after that, strengthening requirements for infrastructure implementation by development. So this is really interesting for us to see um, sort of what resonates the most with the community. So. Thank you for that. And we'll go ahead on to the next poll. Poll number two is for street design and engineering. So uh, Nicole's gonna bring it up again, thank you. So there, uh, I will read them as A, B, C, D. A, safer intersections to reduce co collision risk between people driving, walking, and bicycling. B, prioritize the safety comfort and convenience needs of active transportation users in road designs. It's really targeting um, the prioritization element. Uh, C, lower speeds through design, especially in urban areas, activity centers, and residential neighborhoods. So that's different from the regulation 
uh, lower speeds through design, meaning the way that we are designing the roadways. D, safer access to bus stops on both sides of the road. And E, innovative technology to address traffic safety issues. So again, I'll give you a little bit over a minute to think about that one. Select your top two priorities, please. All right, thank you all. So it looks like the top uh, priority was safer intersections to reduce collision risk between people driving, walking, and bicycling. This is for the topic area of street design and engineering. And then uh, right behind that was prioritizing the safety, comfort, and convenience needs of active transportation users in road design. And then after that was lowering speeds through design. So that's really Interesting. Thank you all. Go ahead to the next one. Our next uh, topic area is equity and social justice. So over the topic area of equity and social justice, we have um, four uh, recommendations for which you to choose your top two priorities. So uh, the recommendation A is prioritize maintenance and capital improvements in high need areas. And high need is based on a spe spatial equity analysis. So we're looking at socio-demographic factors like availability of a vehicle, income, race, disability, age. So this is different from demand or high, uh, uh, high use areas I talked about earlier that are more based on the activity. B, collect race, ethnicity, and disability data of pedestrian and bicycle crash victims and analyze data for disparities. C, prioritize community engagement of groups disproportionately impacted by bicycle and pedestrian crashes. And D, conduct community walk and bicycle audits to determine safety concerns and develop solutions. We have about another minute for this one too. Great, thank you all. Bring up the results. So we had a pretty even spread here between prioritizing the maintenance and capital improvements in high need areas, prioritizing community engagement of groups disproportionately impacted by bicycle and pedestrian crashes, and conducting community walk and bicycle audits to determine safety concerns and develop solutions. It's really helpful. All right, we'll go to our next poll. So this poll will be for the funding and implementation topic area. And please again, select your top two priorities of five this time. So with 
uh, recommendation A, task for, uh, establishing an interdisciplinary task force to oversee the program, uh, which we've already sort of initiated now, but we'll transition into a program task force. Um, more and dedicate or dedicated safety funding for small spot improvements. So, for instance, um, improved crosswalks or uh, filling in those small missing links of sidewalk. Um, more maintenance funding for existing sidewalks, trails, crosswalks, safety equipment like street lighting. Ex uh, D, sorry, A, B, C, D, D, expediting building the active transportation network, so sidewalks and trails. And E, funding for non infrastructure programs like road safety campaigns and some of the educational uh, programs that I talked about earlier. And about another minute for that one also. I hear that some of you are saying it's tough to choose and. Yeah, it sure is, but thank you for trying because um, there's a lot of great uh, need and recommendations. So it, the results from the poll for funding and implementation. Uh, it looks like the highest ranked was more or and dedicated safety funding for small spot improvements, such as new or better crosswalks or filling in sidewalk gaps. And then after that, I have. More maintenance funding for existing sidewalks, trails, crosswalks, and safety equipment. And then also expediting building the active transportation network, sidewalks, and trails. So thank you all. So our fifth out of six polls is for education and traffic safety culture. We have five recommendations here. Please select the top two priorities for education and traffic safety culture. A is regular targeted education campaigns about traffic safety. B is encouraging private and public sector employees to provide road safety education, employers to provide road safety education to employees. C is traffic safety education curriculums for students and adults. D web page that a web page that is an interactive clearinghouse for road safety information for the public. And E, speed feedback or the your speed signage at high crash locations along high risk corridors and in school zones. Again, please select your top two priorities for education and traffic safety culture. All right, thank you. So for education and traffic safety culture, it looks like we had the most 
uh, positive feedback for speed feedback or your speed signage at high crash locations along high risk corridors and in school zones. And then second for regular targeted education campaigns about traffic safety. Thank you. All right, our last poll uh, for the one of the target areas, and then we're going to talk about all of the target areas, uh, is monitoring and evaluation. So please select your top two priorities for the monitoring and evaluation target area. A, identify road safety performance measures and targets. B, identify the most common factors related to pedestrian, bicycle, and vehicle crashes and the most affected people. C, a permanent interactive digital map on the county website to collect transportation safety concerns. D, a formal bicycle and pedestrian count program. And E, before and after studies of transportation safety improvements. And again, for all of these that we've looked at today, these are not our only recommendations, but some of the key ones that we wanted to bring to you for your thoughts on priorities. So we'll have about another minute with this poll. If you can hear that, I live next to a busy road with <laughs> lots of loud cars. So, sorry about that. All right. Oh, so for this one, we had a lot, a little more even of a spread. <laughs> so we had the most uh, nine votes for identify the most common factors related to pedestrian, bicycle, and vehicle crashes and the most affected people. But right after that, we had eight for identify road safety performance measures and targets, and eight for before and after studies of transportation safety improvements, and seven for a permanent interactive digital map on the county website. So it sounds like y'all like them all. All right, so for our last poll, uh, we kind of want to get a feeling for, you know, you've only seen some of the recommendations, but some of our key ones, what um, subject area really stood out to you the most? Um, we actually are not letting you choose three out of, out of six. So which of these um, do you feel like our priorities as a subject area? Um, what kind of resonated with you the most in terms of that? So there again, policy and planning, street design and traffic engineering, equity and social justice, funding and implementation, education and traffic safety culture, and monitoring and evaluation. And you can pick three for this one instead of two. You get an extra. <laughs> since we have so many uh, categories.
right, that wraps up that poll. Okay, so your favorite with 16 out of 25 votes was street design and traffic engineering, uh, followed by funding and implementation and equity and social justice and policy and planning. So thank you very much for engaging with us in that interactive polling process. It's really interesting to see what you all prioritize. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and now open the floor for discussion. Um, as a reminder, we still have some next steps to talk about after this, um, but we'd love to hear what your thoughts are on everything that I've shared tonight. If you have questions or concerns um, about the proposed strategies that we brought tonight, and if you have any ideas on other strategies you'd like to see. So Nicole's gonna manage the Q&A portion. I will be available for questions. Thank you, Lauren. So we have a few comments and questions uh, in the Q and A. Um, so let's start with um, a uh, participants sharing a personal experience um, that I would like to read to you. It's a little bit longer, but uh, while you're thinking about the discussion question, this is really interesting um, information. So um, uh, Maya, is that your name? Maya Irwin. I was hit while crossing the streets or strodes in 2009 and 2016. I've been struggling with severe sensitivities to bright lights, flashing lights, moving lights, and loud noises since at least 2010, which have been disabling since 2013. Other concussion survivors sometimes have similar symptoms. In addition, neurodivergent people can face similar challenges. Now I have a lot, lot of trouble with turning signals, hazard lights, and so on but it gets much worse with faster lights or with red lights such as ambulances or when they come from different directions and different heights. I do what I can with visual exercises and with sunglasses, head, earplugs, ear protection, etc. but I will still have a lot of trouble with all the lights. I started following this after encountering new flashing traffic lights. I can't cross at the affected intersections. I have to find some place else to cross. I see that the plan also includes rapid flashing beacons. From what I've read, these can flash six to ten times in uh, six tenths to one second, which is definitely in the seizure range and seems like um, blinding, painful, disorienting lights I've encountered near construction. So I've been wondering what photosensitive people are supposed to do. So, first of all, I'd like to say I'm really sorry to hear about your uh, crashes that you. Um, suffered. And this is very interesting information to me. I um, work as an engineer on active transportation projects, including on um, rectangular rapid flashing beacon projects, which you mentioned. Um, they do, these beacons do have lights that flash at a rate similar to that of an emergency vehicle. So if an emergency vehicle creates a problem, I can understand why these lights create a problem. They are currently an interim approval on a national level um, to, to be used uh, across the country, but they're not fully approved. And I think this is really good feedback for why um, some of the downsides, we get a lot of positive feedback for them, but this is the first time I've heard of someone struggling with them in this way. So I think that's really helpful information for us to um, consider. Um, and, I guess as far as what can you do, uh, they most of the ones that we have in the county right now have a push button associated with them. So you're not required to push the button to cross the street. That's what causes the lights to flash. Um, some of them are uh, activated. Well, I guess just one right now is activated by um, passively just by arriving at the intersection. So that would create more of a problem uh, for you. But I would encourage you not to not to press the push button. Um, uh, and look for cars that are yielding to you and crossing the street. And again, I'm very sorry to hear about your, um, your crashes. So we have three comments from Sonia Brehi. She says, um, we need more funding. Um, and uh, she mentioned that she would have voted for the report card. So that was an option not listed in the presentation, but it's in the uh, longer document that's available on the website. 
Um, and she also mentioned that equity should be centered in all, not a choice. That's really great feedback. I think we have, um, we have a category for equity, so we make sure that we're evaluating it independently, but it is um, part of all of our work. Um, it's part of the one Fairfax program is to have equity in everything that we're doing um, and it's to be, to con to be, for it to be considered. And so thank you for all that feedback. Sonia. The next question um, is from Michelle. Will there be any special special priority for ensuring complete streets near schools or business areas with access to shopping, food, and public services, especially schools with larger populations or which are located on busy streets? Our school seems unsafe. So when we look at need, we definitely look at schools. So schools are a very large um, generator or tractor, lots of people want to go to them and, and are leaving from them. So they um, uh, are often considered a high need location um, and to, uh, or a high use location. Sorry, I described the differences before, so I don't want to confuse you. But they are a high use location and and actually they do have a high need as well in terms of the, the age of the, of the people. So um, in our needs analysis, we look at uh, youth as having a a greater need than an adult. Um, so we do have uh, an emphasis on schools. We already have uh, one funding program, um, the Safe Routes to School program, specifically targeting areas within two miles of a uh, K through eight school. Um, but I think yes, it, it, as, you, as we mentioned with the um, uh, your speed signs being targeted to school areas, it is important to us for us to prioritize areas near schools, um, just because they're often getting a lot of traffic, um, foot and bike traffic. We also have uh, some raised hands um, from um, participants that would like to speak. Um, so I'm going to unmute Ethan Epstein. Hi. Um one question I have is um, related to, um, I'm not sure, I, I don't think anyone on this panel would be aware of, but I had emailed um, about a month ago my um, county representative um, regarding walking to the metro. It's about a mile, but it's a pretty unsafe walk crossing uh, large roads, which um, with despite having 35 mile per hour speed limits, as you guys talked about, they're not really designed that way and everyone's speeding. Um, so it's not really safe to cross, not safe to get there. Um, and I got a response that um, regarding traffic calming measures that um, could potentially be taken, but I was told that those wouldn't work on Route 123 or Old Courthouse because of the higher traffic volumes than those programs permit. Um, and that's just a quote from the email I got back. Um, so, of course, the high traffic volumes are what causes it to be dangerous. Um, so that kind of uh, defeats the point of traffic calming, um, if you ask me to not do it on roads where it's needed. So I was wondering, um, especially because I heard you guys mention that this would be focused mainly on residential and commercial areas. Um, is there any plan to um, improve pedestrian safety like outside of neighborhoods, basically? Thanks, Ethan. Yes, absolutely. So. Uh, the traffic calming program that we have right now uh, has limitations uh, in the roads in which it's allowed to be used on. So that's partially just because if it involves a speed bump, for instance, and the, and the travel speed is too fast, then that doesn't really, they don't really work together. We want to use speed bumps on 25 mile an hour roads to slow people down. Um, we have some other traffic calming tools in our toolkit, but they're just currently we're only able to use them on through that program on 25 mile, mile per hour roads. Um, for uh, these larger roads with higher traffic volumes and higher speeds, we're really trying to improve the crossings of the roads, including the frequency of the crossing, the um, the length of time, and even takes to wait at the at a traffic mm -hmm. signal or the frequency of traffic signals, and then um, also just the road design and the environment when you're on the roadway that you experience when you're driving. Um, is it does it feel constrained and make you want to feel, travel slower, or does it feel 
um, wide open, like you can speed. Um, so those are some of the things that we're working on to try to help with those type of bigger roadways. It's, it's not outside of the traffic calming program, but it's not outside of the safe streets for all program by any means. We're definitely looking at those roadways as well. Um, I just talked a little bit more today about the importance of residential streets and commercial areas. And we have another raised hand. Uh, I'm going to uh, unmute Cheryl Sim. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Great presentation. And I'm going to assume that when the West Falls Church active transportation study begins, that this is going to be a component of what we're going to address in that study. But my question is about funding. Uh, Supervisor Faust has indicated that there is no uh, surplus funds available for any new projects and all money is committed until 2026. So I'm wondering if you're going to actually discuss funding and if you could give us some idea, I don't know if you're gonna do that tonight or maybe in another presentation about where you actually have put in place or putting in place projects. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so funding, uh, we have a lot of recommendations for funding. Oh, I'm sorry, if you don't, uh, would Chris be able to take this question for just a moment? Yes, I see uh, we have an extra, an extra participant with us. Um, sure, thank you, Cheryl. Um, the board has funded uh, over, over half of a billion dollars towards pedestrian and bicycle projects over 20 fiscal years. But unfortunately, that's still uh, not, not nearly enough. We, we get uh, a sidewalk request uh, al almost every day, but certainly every week. Um, the uh, the the year that you referenced uh, FY FY 2026 is correct in that that's um, the funding that's been allocated towards transportation projects in our transportation priorities plan that um, that body of transportation projects which the board originally improved in uh, 2014 and then reapproved in 2019 included 150 pedestrian and bicycle projects. And that's on top of the uh, 500 or so bus stops that we've improved over 20 years. But again, you know, we acknowledge that's that's not enough. So what uh, this uh, effort we're talking about tonight is helping to inform the Board of Supervisors about what the community's priorities are. I'm sure the board is, is already aware of it, <laughs> but the uh, input that we're getting from you all tonight is very important to help uh, continue to make the case both from from your perspective as as uh, residents and taxpayers uh, and from staff's perspectives as, as the staff that work on these issues that uh, there needs to be more funding. Now, Supervisor Faust did just do a board matter uh, at uh, one of the recent boards asking the county executive uh, to identify uh, 100 million uh, additional uh, 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 dollars of funding over over six fiscal years, beginning with this fiscal year, next fiscal year, uh, so that we don't have to say that the answer is there's no money available until 2026. So um, staff uh, is under those uh, uh, that request from the board. And we'll have to see, um, you know, what what uh, the county is able to come up with. So, it, funding is our biggest challenge. It's not that staff isn't aware of the infrastructure needs, the safety needs. It's not that the board of supervisors is not aware, but uh, unfortunately, the the needs uh, far outweigh um, the funding that's available at this point. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Chris. I, I'm Michael Greeno. I'm with the capital project section and Fairfax County Department of Transportation. Chris pretty much said everything uh, I was going to say. Um, I will note though that um, we, you know, we do apply for funding when we can. Lauren had mentioned the um, um, Safe Routes to School program. There's other uh, programs that are uh, 
well suited for bike ped improvement projects. And so we do apply for those grants when feasible. And we're constantly looking for additional money sources. And as Chris noted, the board has asked the county exec um, and to see if we can identify some additional money. And our coordination and funding division is working on that right now while we continue to work on the needs and project needs throughout the county. Thank you, uh, Chris and Michael. Uh, we have another question in the chat from Robert. Um, is Fairfax County able to implement active Fairfax without the involvement of VDOT? It occurs to me that VDOT may be big, the big obstacle to safer streets since it's primarily focused seem to be expediting the movement of vehicles without any concerns for pedestrians and cyclists. Thank you for the question. So uh, to fill anyone else in, uh, for, uh, all of the roadways in Fairfax County are owned and maintained by VDOT. So whenever we construct something within the county, we're doing it under VDOT permit. Um, sometimes we actually do take maintenance of the sidewalks or the trails that we build, or some of the existing sidewalks and trails in the county are already maintained by the county, but um, for all the roadways, it's, it's by VDOT. So they're a major stakeholder for us and a major partner. And VDOT's been um, improving a lot of their uh, priorities and a lot of their own um, uh, recommendations and their own um, ways of operating uh, to try to respond to the needs of pedestrians and bicyclists. We partner with them every year in the repaving efforts where we're adding bike lanes on roadways and we're also adding crosswalks through those efforts. So um, we do and the county staff does a crop does crosswalk studies and we do crosswalk counts um, to determine a need and then um, VDOT marks those crosswalks and sometimes they're able to add curb ramps where we don't have them already. And then we uh, work together to do a signage plan for those crosswalks as well. So um, VDOT is a great partner for us. And actually Heidi Mitter is on the call today. She's our um, the bicycle and pedestrian coordinator for VDOT. Uh, and uh, we're working really closely with them. And a lot of the recommendations that we have require their partnership. So we do have recommendations to make some modifications to some of the practices that VDOT does today to try to make them even better for pedestrians and bicyclists. So yes, they will continue to be a key partner for us. So we have um, actually someone from VDOT uh, on the line, Heidi Mitter, the bicycle pedestrian um, uh, coordinator uh, for the Northern Virginia VDOT. Um, um, so Heidi, if you don't mind to put your contact information uh, in the chat um, so we can share that um, if you would like. Otherwise you can um, see no active Fairfax at fairfaxcounty.gov. Uh, hold on, she shared it. Let me share this with you all. There you go. Thank you, Heidi. So Heidi is a great uh, resource for any sort of questions related to VDOT's approach to um, active transportation safety. And that uh, concludes the um, questions. No more in the chat. Thank you. Thank you. Great discussion. Um, we'll go ahead and talk about next steps. So. Uh, we have a second virtual community meeting, which will be held on Thursday, November 18th at 630 PM. Uh, if you would like more information on that meeting to share with others, it's, uh, the information's on our website. We have the link here. And then we're collecting comments and feedback on, uh, the safe streets for all program recommendations, uh, through December 10th, 2021, 2021 uh, via email or by phone. So our email. Contact is activefairfax at fairfaxcounty.gov. And our phone number is 703-877-5600. And then the program will be considered by the Board of Supervisors in spring 2022. And then we'll need to begin work approved on uh, the additional resources that'll be needed for implementation, um, such as funding and staffing. Um, following that, our, our next steps are additional community engagement. So once the program is established, we'll have more community meetings, um, walk and bike audits and that type of thing. Um, and in the meantime, if you want to contact us, uh, I'm providing this map that I said I would provide earlier, which is the interactive map for 
barriers and destinations for active transportation. Um, and I don't know if Nicole can drop these things in the chat for us. That'd be great. Or I can do it after. Um, or you can send us an email again at, to activefairfax at fairfaxcounty.gov. And then once again, here's our contact information, um, our website. And thank you all so much for joining us tonight. And thank you for your concern for pedestrian and bicycle and all active transportation safety in Fairfax County. Um, and we'll look forward to continued uh, engagement with you all. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.